Yeah. 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 Today I'm going to talk 
and give you a high level overview of uh, why they went to Russia and uh, what they did while they were up there and what the veterans did once they came back from Russia. So the uh, thing I want to point out here, this is the crest of the 339th Infantry Regiment. Uh, it was adopted after they came back. It's one of the few, if only the only, Army, U.S. Army military crest that has shrilled writing in that says, uh, the bayonet decides. That's what that translates to. So you've got polar bear on the crest along with three merlots, uh, ducks there, ducks that, those are taken from Cadillac's crest found in Detroit. So they were called originally Detroit's own, or they were still in custody of training before they went over. That was their nickname. Newspapers gave it to them because primarily most of the men were from uh, the Detroit area, southeast Michigan area. But basically, they were almost all exclusively in the 339 from Michigan and a few from the surrounding states. <coughs> I'd like to start out with a couple of quotes. Uh, first one is from Nikita Khrushchev. Many of us uh, older folks remember that name. Premier of uh, the Soviet Union back in the 50s and 60s. He came to Hollywood back in 1959. He was uh, very, very popular. The press followed him. Uh, they were always hanging on every word. Of course, he was translated for this. And uh, he started uh, lecturing the press as he's entering a dinner for the, uh, at the 20th Century Fox Studios in Hollywood. He said, we remember the grim days when your American soldiers were on our soil. And all the capitalist countries of Europe and America marched on our country to strangle our new revolution. But never have any of our soldiers been on your soil. But your soldiers were on Russian soil. This is 40 years after he left, and nobody knew what he was talking about. He already been forgotten. A few years earlier, Winston Churchill uh, was in the U.S. and he was quoted uh, in June of 54 as stating, if I had been properly supported in 1919, I think I might have been able to strangle Bolshevism in his cradle. But everybody turned up their hands and said, how oh, shocking. So from both sides, this was looked at, you know, in retrospect, as an attempt to cradle uh, communism before it was fully birthed. A uh, little background, World War I ended on November 11th, 1918. It was called Armistice Day up until, the, I believe, the 1950s when it was renamed Veterans Day. But it was originally created as a holiday to recognize uh, the end of fighting between the Germans and the Allied countries. Uh, people were out in the streets celebrating. This was Important event. Everybody was waiting on it. There had been some false alarms uh, a day or two prior to that, with press reports coming saying that an armistice had been signed. But when it was finally announced, uh, people went out in the streets and celebrated. And here's a photo taken on Woodward. You can see GL Hudson's store in the background. But uh, for most, of the war was over, but not for everybody. Uh, a little refresher here the Great War, as it was known then began in August of 1914, and it was between the Allied powers and the Central powers. Uh, the uh, Allies being the ones in the greenish tint, Britain, France, Russia, Italy, and then the Central powers were German, Austria, Hungary, Turkey, Bulgaria. The U.S. Uh, did not join in. In fact, it was uh, very politically unpopular, even the idea of the U.S joining the war, and ultimately took a uh, German uh, telegram which uh, indicated a plot of Germany and Mexico to uh, uh, allow Mexico to claim parts of the U.S. if Germany was uh, successful. That's what basically tipped the, uh, the uh, U.S. and the view of the U.S. as to uh, tipping over to the side of favoring entry into the war. And that happened on April 6, 1917, when Congress formally declared war and we entered on the sides of the uh, 
the Allied Powers. At the time, we were the sixth largest army in the world. The U.S. had the sixth largest army, uh, 125,000 men. Uh, we were right behind Belgium. Belgium was number five. So that just gives you an idea. We weren't prepared to fight this war. So, the uh, Congress voted to uh, have a conscription law where uh, able-bodied men were compelled to uh, register for the draft. And on June 5th, 1917, uh, that was the first draft registration. Uh, men between the 21 and uh, 31 were compelled to sign up. Didn't matter if you were uh, an alien. <coughs> didn't matter. If you were between those ages and you were living in the United States at that time, you were compelled to show up at a uh, local registration booth sometime between 7 a.m. and 9 p.m., uh, depending upon uh, your Eastern Standard or Central or whatever. So this was, in, a, in effect, it turned out to be a civic holiday. Uh, it was also the threat of uh, demonstrations. There were a lot of uh, sympathizers, particularly like the communist sympathizers at the time, that were threatening to, to disrupt this. And uh, there were some instances in Michigan where there was some uh, violence and pisticus and whatever. But uh, in Detroit, where they were most worried about it, there was no, no problem. And it was attributed to the Spanish American War veterans who volunteered to stand guard at the registration. The other aspect of this being a civic holiday is that most of the manufacturing plants closed down, the large ones at least. And Ford Motor, uh, they uh, closed for the day and they told all of their employees, that, all their men who were within this age range, that uh, come back tomorrow morning and show us your registration slip. If you don't have it, there's no more work for you. In fact, the police were authorized after 9 p.m. that night. If they stopped anybody on the streets between those ages, if they didn't produce that registration slip, they were going to jail. So this was a big deal, but it did result in uh, giving us the seeds of a uh, much larger standing army. Uh, Michigan's men did answer the call. Uh, in order to train all these new draftees, though, we had to build uh, training camps. And the one for Michigan was built in uh, Battle Creek, it's called Camp Custer. Fort Custer now, and uh, they began work on that uh, in that really, uh, really summer, early summer of 1917, and on August 25th, the 85th Division, commonly known as the Custer Division, was activated at Camp Custer, and uh, that guy right there is my grandfather. This is Company I, I just took the uh, little section out showing him. It's one of those photos where the camera rotates on a tripod and takes a large uh, panoramic photo. It took until October of 1917 before the first U.S. troops actually entered combat, and that was on the Western Front in France. In the meantime, Russia is in turmoil. The, uh, Tsar was forced to abdicate, and a provisional government was formed under uh, Kerensky. And on November 7th uh, of 1917, his government fell to the Bolsheviks. That was the start of the October Revolution, where the Bolsheviks came to power uh, in St. Petersburg, which was the seat of government in Russia. Uh, the reason I'm calling it November 7th here is they operate on different calendars. Our calendar was November 7th. It was still October in Russia at the time. So one little note here is, you know, the Port Huron Times reported uh, that Kerensky's government has uh, fallen and civil war now facing Russia. So that's the first hint that uh, Russia is going to be descending into the chaos. But I'm sure no one at that time, in November 1917, Realized that the Port Heron boys sucked up in the middle of that. Eventually, the Bolsheviks wanted no part of uh, fighting with the Germans and they sued for peace with the Germans. So, 
through the Treaty of Brest Lithuania on March 3rd. The fighting basically ended on the Eastern Front, which was basically in the Ukraine. Uh, so now the communist the Bolshevik uh, revolution continues. They're descending into civil war, but there's no more fighting on the Eastern Front. Germany is free to start moving divisions westward to the Western Front. And this was very much a concern of the Allied troops because the large numbers of Americans that they were counting on had not arrived yet to be put into battle. Among the first, though, to complete their training was the 85th Division, and they departed Camp Custer beginning on July 11th that year. It took out of 30,000 men in the uh, 85th Division, took 70 trains to move them from Gallup Creek to the Port of New York. And they had to get out because more arrivals were already on their way from the next round of draft notices. They uh, took them through uh, Detroit, under the Detroit River, across Ontario to uh, Niagara Falls, and then down the Hudson to, uh, to New York City. At the same time that they're leaving, President Wilson is getting hammered by the British and French to join them in a military intervention in Russia uh, because of the concern of the Germans now being able to move more troops to the Western Front. And they had exhausted their supply of able-bodied uh, soldiers. They were very, very concerned that uh, the war would be lost on the Western Front unless something was done to intervene in Russia. Uh, against the advice of his uh, generals and his Secretary of State, uh, Wilson agreed to send a limited number of troops to North Russia and also <coughs> a similar number of troops to Vladivostok in Siberia as a port on the Pacific Ocean at the other end of the Trans-Siberian Railroad. Uh, and I'll explain that a little bit more. I'm not going to talk too much about what happened in Siberia, but I just wanted to point out Oftentimes, Siberia was used interchangeably for the polar bears, and that's not the case. Polar bears fought in North Russia and the European part of Russia. The 27th and 31st infantry uh, fought in Siberia uh, by the last at the same time, and for basically the same reasons. And those reasons, the Allied objectives that President Wilson outlined was, uh, number one, we're sending troops to North Russia to protect military supplies that were in the port of Archangel. Archangel is on the uh, offset of the White Sea, which then opens up into the Arctic. And for about uh, eight months of the year, uh, you can get stuff in and out of Archangel, but eventually the port does freezes. It eventually does freeze. And we have been sending the US, Great Britain, and France have been sending war material for years and years uh, to the Tsar's army. The concern was how the Bolsheviks would be in control of that military supplies and or possibly also given to the Germans. Second reason was to rescue the stranded Czech Legion. Uh, these were soldiers that now had no army to fight in. Uh, they were stranded on the Eastern Front because there was no more fighting on the Eastern Front. They wanted to get to the Western Front to fight on the half of the Allies, but they couldn't get through the Germany to go there. So the plan was to come across Russia and Siberia to Vladivostok, the Trans-Siberian Railroad, and then take ships all the way around Africa, South Africa, to get to the Western Front. And they were stuck. There was a lot of fighting, even though they had a pass signed by Trotsky and Lenin for safe passage. Uh, and they would get along the railroad to each little town, and Walsh was to start shooting them. They were stranded. So the idea was maybe we can get them out through our country instead of sending them all the way to the Pacific. And the last item, obviously, is the threat of sending uh, military intervention in the Archangel might keep more German army divisions at the Eastern Front. And this is a photo here of some of the uh, equipment being offloaded uh, after the Allies arrived in the Archangel. So that was January, July 17th when the President gave the directive. A week, less than a week later, uh, U.S. Army General John Pershing 
makes the decision on which troops to send. So he gave the order to detach 4,700 men of the 85th Division to uh, be uh, trained separately in England before, and instead of going to France, they would then instead be sent to North Russia. So they were dubbed the American North Russia Expeditionary Force. And there were four infantry regiments in the 85th Division, and the 339th was the one that was selected. Some people say it's because they're mostly uh, men from northern climates. It might not be so hard for them to adjust. Uh, I'm not sure there was much in the way of any real thought as to why the 339th and why not the 340th. Uh, if they were just in the right place, at the right time, or the wrong place, however you want to classify it. They, when they got to Liverpool, the 339th, along with the 1st Battalion and 310th Engineers and some of the other supporting groups, were sent to a separate camp uh, near London, while the rest of the 85th Division uh, basically ended up over the Western Front and they were used as replacements. After about uh, three weeks in, uh, in uh, England, the 339th and the 310th, they were given all the uh, equipment, uniforms, uh, machine guns, rifles, all, all their U.S. issued equipment. Such were taken away, they were given uh, Vickers with Lewis machine guns, which they hadn't trained on. They were given the Monsanto got rifles uh, instead of the M2, which I think is what they had. So they had to rearm using new equipment. And they spent those three weeks training and marching through the countryside. And as luck would have it, the new uniforms that were given were all wool and they had a heat wave uh, during those three weeks in the bodies. So it was not a pleasant period for the men of the 339th. Uh, on August 25th, uh, they boarded troop trains and were sent to Newcastle on time to northern England. And three troop, troop, troop ships were waiting for them, the HMT Somali, the Titus, and the Nagoya. And after an uneventful trip around uh, the other beaches of Norway, they arrived in Archangel on September 4th. Unbeknownst to them, two of those three ships had just hauled Italian troops who were carrying the Spanish influenza bus. <laughs> By September 4th, uh, there were at least two or three men near death and 60 or more uh, that were in severe uh, danger. In the first month of September, there were 60 total deaths due to the Spanish influenza in one state. The lucky ones were the ones that didn't get sent to the hospital. They got on the barges or got on the railroad cars and got out of the congested area of our community. They didn't move and they had the flu. Uh, chances were they wouldn't survive. The other thing that uh, President Wilson dictated to his generals is that these uh, soldiers would be placed under British command once they got to Russia. So, first thing they find out after they take care of all the sick and get them into the hospitals and uh, get that accommodated uh, is that there's no war materials left. The Walsh Lakes have taken them all, put them on barges and gone upriver or uh, south towards Moscow on the railroad. So, very sad. You know, your, your main objective for coming here, well, you know, sorry, uh, it's nothing to protect. So, uh, you guys. Get on these barges and go chase the Bolsheviks. These guys get on the uh, road cars and go fight for the Bolsheviks. So that's how they got put into the fight right from the get go. And uh, Wilson's limitations on their use were, were totally ignored. Uh, this is a map that appeared in the 1939 edition of the Chicago Tribune about this whole adventure. And uh, it's a good map because it's color and it shows basically here these dark orange areas. Those were the limits of the Allied advance. Uh, this is how they got to Archangel, coming around Norway. That's the port of Archangel, that's the Northern Virginia River. And this is the railroad line that connects Archangel with Moscow. Archangel is about 600 miles north of Moscow and about 100 miles south of the Arctic Circle. The Arctic Circle just to give you an idea of where they're at. Uh, 
Uh, there were four, basic, basically four main fronts where fighting occurred over the period of time that they were up there. The Onega Front in this region, down along the uh, Laga Railroad, from Alvesakaya down to Hensta, and then along the Vinya River and a tributary of the Bagra River. So this is, and the final one is Pinega up in here. So those are the main fronts uh, where fighting occurred. And this represents the limits of Allied advances, which uh, basically was uh, during the deep winter months. And uh, on January 19th, the Bolsheviks counterattacked. So this was the limits as of about January, mid-January 1919. Americans weren't up there on their own. They fought alongside the British, Canadian, and French troops. Part of the overall British plan was to raise an equal number of men locally to equal the numbers of uh, Allied troops. And those were called Russian, white Russians, since their sympathies were with the Tsar and the Tsar's army, which made them naturally opposed to the Bolsheviks. Uh, Unfortunately, that part of the plan never worked real well. Uh, when you're in the middle of the Russian Civil War, the whites are fighting the reds, cousins are fighting cousins. Uh, your allegiance varied day to day based on who you thought had the upper hand. So the white Russian troops uh, were never very reliable. Uh, there were instances where they turned on their British officers and uh, massacred them. Um, they couldn't be relied on for artillery, artillery support either because of the first start of shooting, they would abandon their field guns. There was no choice. The Americans did not have artillery support there. They were just going to be doing uh, guarding the material, war material. So why would you need artillery? Well, now they're out there fighting without any artillery. Fortunately, they were able to train some white Russians who were somewhat affected with the artillery, but just before the port closed through the ice, they were able to get veterans from the Western Front end. 67th Canadian Field Artillery uh, sent two uh, battalions up there to, uh, to provide the artillery support that they needed. So uh, eventually they did get it, but that wasn't until November when those guys were finally out in the field. There were major buyout battles. I'm not going to get into a lot of them. A lot of small skirmishes, but uh, during the months of September and October, all the fighting along the railroad front to the south, the Americans were in the thick of that. And chasing the Bolsheviks. The Bolsheviks would take their armored train and back up and blow the bridge and then bombard us and then we'd send engineers to fix the blown bridge and call them or whatever. So it was that kind of fighting for almost two months. And we eventually stalled out in late October. As the weather got bad, they were giving orders to uh, adopt a defensive posture on all the fronts for the wintertime. It was obvious that uh, they weren't going to meet their objectives of getting the you know, Czech Legion either. So that was a running, series of running battles on the railroad front. On the, the Vinya River front, there was a noble battle that <coughs> told us on, uh, coincidentally, Armistice Day. And the battles at Ninjagora and Sarkagora on January 19th <coughs> to the 22nd, that marked the start of the Bolshevik. Advance. They knew the territory, they knew the forest, they knew the swamps, everything was frozen. They could find the trails, the back trails that the British and the Americans had no ideas even existed. So by January, it was pretty clear there were no more Allied troops coming because the reports were closed. So it was like uh, a way of cat playing with a mouse, just biding their time until they went on the offense, which started in January. Last major battle was in. Bolshevik in the first few days of April, and it ended in a draw because a warm front came through, the snow got soft, and everybody backed off because they had to be able to get their artillery back, not lose their equipment or men, because once the thaw came through, uh, you couldn't move anything. So that's how that happened. Here's some views of what Archangel looked like. It was a pretty cosmopolitan city back in that time. It was founded by Peter the Great. It was a fur trading center and a wood forestry products port. And they would ship during the summer to Europe, Great Britain. Uh, they 
Yeah, the streetcar line, you can see the streetcar tracks here. This is the Trudsky Prospect today, that's its name. This is a government building there. Uh, you can see the uh, Cathedral of St. Michael, the patron saint of Archangel. Uh, here's the Derricks of the Port, and that's the Divinity River. This is, again, on Trudsky Prospect. You can see the streetcar line. This is building here was used by the Allies for their headquarters in Archangel. And what this is here, it's a little hard to tell, but you can tell by that bowl there. That's a horse-drawn, a Russian pony horse uh, sled. That's how basically everything moved up there uh, during the winter time. Ponies were very hardy, they didn't eat much, and they, uh, they would uh, run day and night. A little story about the uh, streetcar. Because of the massive influx of refugees fleeing Moscow and fleeing the Bolsheviks, they all ended up in Archangel because it's the end of the railroad line. So the population basically doubled uh, compared to prior to the start of the Great War. So you've got inflation going on, you've got lack of food, and that caused the streetcar workers to go on strike when they saw all these Americans coming. They thought they had some leverage. Turns out the British solved the problem by going to American officers and saying, find your streetcar workers among your troops, put them to work. So some of the uh, men who had been in civilian life, workers on the Detroit streetcar systems, ended up becoming strike workers. Uh, uh, they strike quickly. <laughs> uh, got some of my grandfather's letters that have survived. They're up here on display. I just took a couple of excerpts out of there just to give you a feel for what his thoughts were. October 20th, it's getting colder every day, but he's okay because they've got the sheet line coats, so they're, they're, they're pretty warm. They still hadn't gotten their barracks bags, so though. They were in the bottom of the holds of the ships, and they never got sent to them, never caught up to them until right about this time when it's already snowing. He says we have great times when we advance down the railroad line, taking one little town after another. And these little towns are all on the railroad. And this is what I like. He says this life is not bad. It's like hunting rabbits, only on a bigger scale. Yeah. If you look at the letters, they're all signed by the officer who censored. So he had to, I think, put you know, some ideas in between the lines there for his parents. He was a farm boy. He was growing up. Great, born and raised in Blood Mountain Mount back then, when he was born in 1895. And he got uh, drafted in 1918. It was all still farmland, open fields. And I'm sure he was pretty handy with a few rabbits. That was his hobby. So. In February, little February, he says the war may be over in France, but it's not over here in the wild to Russia. Uh, this is not the Western. It's hardly no front at all. You couldn't really tell what the lines were. You call this a railroad front. But basically, it was a railroad, you know, one or two tracks, and Americans controlled maybe you know, a thousand yards on either side of it. So 2,000 yards wide and 100 miles long, that's not a front. That's not even defensive. That's the point he was trying to make there. This is a photo that was taken a couple of days after he wrote that letter. He didn't mention it, and he didn't even know it. But this was taken on the railroad front. Uh, seven men, six from Company I and one from Company M, were awarded the Croix de Guerre by the French. And uh, they were actually pinned on the by British General in the Iron Side, who was in charge of the uh, campaign. Uh, in my grandfather's case, and most of the Company I, and uh, they were awarded, or awarded for the year, and later on the Distinguished Service Cross from the U.S. for valor during a battle on November 4th along the railroad front. In my grandfather's case, he was a corporal in charge of the Lewis machine gun crew, and the Bolsheviks uh, mounted an attack on the left flank, but he was on the right side of the railroad embankment, so it helped out and bring more fire there on the enemy. He brought his crew and his gun and everything and set it right on top of the embankment without any shelter and exposed positions so he could 
fire and uh, repulse the, uh, the attack. So that's why he would recognize the recorded here at that particular time. Uh, French officers in charge of the front lines there. There were also a few French artillery men in support. So that's why he was initially more of a part of the air among these other men, and, and later also recognized uh, the USC. These are a couple more views of what life was like on the railroad front. A verse is the Russian unit of measurement uh, the distance, basically equivalent to like a kilometer or two thirds of a mile. So, they have a new verse, which is always a marker. So there's the first 454 marker alongside the railroad. The front lines at the time, when my grandfather was there, uh, first advanced south, was 443. So this is two, well, not, not even two groups. Oh, 454 is, yeah, uh, 11 groups north of the front lines. First 455 was where the headquarters. That's basically like six miles, They're just outside of the Bolshevik artillery range. That's why we got no additional sidings for the uh, boxcars that they now lived in when they weren't at the front lines. When they were at the front lines, they were living in blockhouses, basically, wooden structures. Uh, this is uh, some episodes from the diary of one of the three tenth engineers up there. Uh, Harry Day. You know that the shortest day of the year being the 21st of December, got about three hours of daylight. That, that just means from pitch black to pitch black, the sun barely takes it over the horizon for that short, just for a short portion of that three hours. Uh, you know that the temperature would be 23 degrees. Next month, January 12th, that's 24 degrees below zero. And describes what he's doing out there. He's got a group of 15 men, Russian men, and 20 Russian women, and their job is to keep the British air going, the British air uh, biplanes up there. So they used large tents for the hangars, so they had to keep snow accumulation off the top of the tents, otherwise they would collapse, and the women kept the field for the snow so they could take off the land. And oh, by the way, I got a heck of a toothache. He notes, because the word now is back out on January 20th, that the previous day the Bolsheviks had went on the offensive over on the Corinthian, well, actually the Niagara River front. And the total list of uh, dead were six officers, 126 men, not including women. Women. That's the total of uh, British, Canadian, French, American. American they did lose some men at that time, but that's the total. Temperatures are holding about the same, 26 below zero. Eight days later, guy gets a permission to go to the depths. So he gets a pass, gets on the train overnight, and goes to uh, Archangel. Uh, and where it says that they, there was no bridge over the river, so the river ended on the south side of the river, which is populated. So, so then the next day, he gets three teeth filled, and, Dennis was drunk on Scotch whiskey. I read that the British sent 40,000 cases of Scotch uh, to keep their uh, officers well lubricated, I guess. But uh, <laughs> the, the, the troops generally found out where the uh, warehouses were to get stored and they could drive the uh, sentries. And there's uh, one case where the uh, men raided a, a stash and brought it back to the barracks. This is when they were in uh, Arkansas and they destroyed the evidence. And they were four bottles to a wooden crate with Excelsior stuff in it, so they were great. So they had to get rid of the Excelsior and the wooden crate before the sergeant came in back in, so they fed it to the hot oil stove. And it got so hot, the flue turned cherry red and started a fire up in the air. <laughs> so the sergeant caught on. <laughs> so anyways, uh, Harry Bagley gets his uh, he fell and on the way back he gets a reindeer ride across the river. So here's some photos, coincidentally, that I was able to find. Here's the uh, type of tents, there's the British biplane. You can see how it's sagging, it doesn't even have snow on it yet, but uh, they had to keep those tents uh, from collapsing. And here's a rainbow, reindeer powered taxi, and that's the St. Michael uh, Orthodox uh, Cathedral there on the, the 
banks of the within the river. This is the embankment down the river, and there on the frozen river right there. This is how American medical detachments spent New Year's Eve on the Dominion River front. They're cooking their dinner in a Russian peasant's house using the combination stove oven and furnace that every peasant had in their dwelling. This is a little better view of what that looked like. You know, that's where the fire is, but uh, they could also be warm their tea water up here. And then there are spaces here for people to sleep. And here's one of the Americans uh, up there posing for the photographer. Uh, this was always the warmest place in the dwelling. And Gerald and Brandon Grandpa got those spots. The Americans were building in one of them. Unlike the British who kicked the families out, Americans agreed to live in there with them, so they didn't kick the families out. I don't think they, they slept on the floor. This is just a, a staged pose for the uh, signal corps photography. Here's a, an identified Russian village, but typical of their dwellings, and then these fences were used to dry the flax. They made their own cloth out of flax. That's how they didn't survive. Photographer caught the girls playing on the seesaw here and snapped the shutter at the right time. Got a few soldiers up here looking out, watching the play. American soldiers, uh, the equipment they were given by the British wasn't the best. They were given the Shackleton kit, which was designed by uh, Sir Ernest Shackleton, the famous Antarctic explorer. Uh, the problem with the boots, the soles were too slippery. Smooth, so the men would slip all the time. They basically abandoned them. They would buy their boots locally, along with things like gloves, which is uh, the skull. Here's the fire in the floor. Uh, during the entire time we were up there, we lost 152 men to uh, death, uh, either killed in action or died of wounds. Another 72 died of uh, disease, mainly influenza. I think that total number of influenza was about. 63. Seven died from accidents. There was also one suicide, and there were 305 wounded but surviving. The photo here was taken on February 4th, the line of February 4th. The photographer noted that the night before they recorded the temperature, the low temperature, 40 below zero. So he's on what kind of sentry uh, outpost here, and that's a black house in the back. And 40 below, uh, sometimes people ask, well, is that centigrade or Fahrenheit? And actually, if you plot the two on a graph, they intersect at 40 below. So 40 below is 40 below in both Celsius and Fahrenheit. Now the families at home are getting letters from their sons. Uh, they know they're stuck for the winter up there. Uh, they're wondering when they're going to get out. One can give them answers. Uh, so they're writing letters to their congressmen, uh, writing letters to the newspapers. So <coughs> in Detroit and Grand Rapids, there was a petition campaign set up in uh, early February. This is one of them, there's February 4th. Uh, and they circulated these petitions and submitted them to Congress, uh, basically asking for Congress to do something to get them out of the earliest opportunity. And it was quite effective. Uh, it was election year, it was 1920, it was going to be election year, so a California senator got involved and started making speeches demanding the administration do something. Uh, by this time, Wilson's not doing very well. He's had a stroke, so nobody's paying attention at the White House. But eventually, in uh, late uh, February, the War Department did make the announcement that the men would be withdrawn and brought home at the earliest available opportunity, which is deliberately vague because uh, the, uh, they didn't want to make it clear they knew that you couldn't get them out until late May, early June, once the Dominion River thawed out. Uh, at the same time this is happening, the petitions and everything, uh, the morale is deteriorating among not only the British troops, but also the French and also the Americans. This is a headline from the Butte, Montana newspaper in April 11, 1919. American soldiers are mutant. And uh, the 
they didn't have legitimate gripes. You know, they, they were drafted to fight Germany, not the Russians. We got no beef with the Bolsheviks. Why are we here? And they would go to their officers, and of course the officers couldn't tell them. And so they would go to the uh, General uh, Stewart, Colonel Stewart. And his, his basic uh, uh, entreaty to the men were, we're here to keep from getting pushed back into the White Sea. You know, so do your damnedest and fight and keep that from happening. So even the officers couldn't buy that. That's not a sharp explanation, but it was still perfectly crystal clear. That's what they had to do. They had to fight, otherwise they would get wiped out and annihilated by the Bolsheviks. So the story behind this, the April 11th newspapers, and that's when the, uh, all the headlines and all the newspapers happened either on the 11th, 10th, 11th, and 12th, that's when the news broke. But it had, it had its roots in a March 30th incident in Archangel and all caught in the eye. And they were in an Archangel for two weeks and then out there trying to go to the front. Everybody else then backs up uh, to head back. So it was their turn of the rotation. They were given the order by a sergeant to pack up the sleds. And nothing happened. The guys were just milling around. So he calls his captain, and his captain comes in, knows what's going on, and he helps with the sergeant. And rather than talking to the men, the captain then calls Colonel Stewart, the top American you know, officer in charge, and he tells him we got a mutiny on our hands. So Stewart comes, gives the guys a talk, hears their grievances, answers their questions, and the men said, okay, and he just packed up and went. And the next day they're back in battle, and you know, they had a real sharp engagement with Wall Street, and they acquitted themselves. So it wasn't a mutiny as such. It was you know, a lot of grousing, a lot of grumbling, allegedly some translation issues. Uh, it's not all these guys spoke English for a while. But it was settled. But the reason it made its way to the newspapers is the British kept a real tight censorship on one out on the lawyers. But they let this one go for whatever reason. Uh, so there's some, some suspicion there that it was done to, by the British to make the Americans look bad. This is mild compared to some of the British movies and French movies, which included men being shot for violating the commands. That all occurred up there. There were no American shot. And in fact, none were punished. So when they came back home, this is the first thing uh, everyone wanted to know. What was the stories in the movie? In um, August, uh, this appeared in the St. Louis Post-Dispatch, explaining basically what I just told you here. That was their view. And what did not happen. Uh, you could get into Archangel in April, but you had to take an icebreaker to do it. And uh, Brigadier General Wiles Richardson was sent by the War Office to get into Archangel as soon as he could and begin an orderly withdrawal plan to get the men out by June and July. So he arrived by this icebreaker on the 17th of April and began that process. And that started by him going to each and every front, looking at every outpost along the way, talking to the men, getting a feel for what's going on out there. Unlike uh, Colonel George Stewart, who basically sat at a desk in Archangel for the duration. So, the performance of our officers was very uneven. There were some great ones, and there were some more good ones, and there were some mediocre ones. The withdrawal process uh, began June 1st when the first ship uh, left uh, Archangel with American soldiers heading back to, in this case now, France for the Laosing and getting all the new equipment. Uh, they, were re they were replaced in the field by a volunteer force that was raised in uh, North Russia excuse me, it was raised in Great Britain. It was called the North Russian Relief Force. So the British volunteers to relieve the Americans arrived in the May, at the same time now the first ships of Americans were leaving. Uh, the first group of Americans arrived home to Detroit on the evening of July 3rd, 1919. It was a long couple of uh, weeks to get here. It took eventually, eventually took a month. But as they left Archangel, they wanted to design a unit patch to you know, signify who they were. So 
And the officers came up with this one here, the North Russia patch, NR. And that's what the men were given as they boarded the ships. And the men took the grouse thing that they didn't want to wear that. Now, somebody lifted that typeface and we merged NR in a blue background from a patent medicine uh, uh, called Nature's Remedy. <laughs> That's why they didn't want to wear it. So they put their heads together and now they're on a Navy ship and they're working with the Navy tailors and whatnot in the ceiling or whatever. And they came up with a polar bear, um, and seen, you know, a white polar bear on a blue background. And those were handmade on board the ship, the first ships that were leaving uh, in June to go to France. And more of those were made by French tailors while they were in uh, Brest, France. And so by the time everybody got to uh, New York, most of them had a polar bear patch, but some of them had already, they had already uh, sewn them to their uniform, like my grandfather, so I don't know if he ever did get a polar bear patch. He may have gotten it, but he never made his way to his uniform. So the first train arrives, coming back now to July 3rd. 7.30 at night, and uh, four trains in full. Uh, the last of them arrived by midnight. And so the men were allowed to go home if they lived locally. They would go to get a hotel room or plenty of citizens who wanted to take these guys into their home for the night because it was only going to be for one night. Because the next day, July 4th, they had a big bash plan for all these returning veterans. It was held on the Isle. This is the banner that the men saw as they got off the ferry and took them to Belle Isle. The previous photo showed them marching from the train station uh, to the steamer to take to Belle Isle. And uh, this photo here was taken on Belle Isle and the photo of my grandfather on the 4th of July. And you can tell him because he's got this white armor. All the men are given an iron band, this is one of them. It uh, says uh, July 4th, 1919, 339th, the Red Bullet. <coughs> Tents have been set up with uh, the company identification so the uh, families could uh, find their sons and have a reunion on the island. And they were allowed to picnic. Uh, they did have to march, so they marched on Central Avenue on Belle Isle. And they assembled at the Belle Isle Casino for some speeches from uh, the officers and also Senator Hiram Johnson from California, who had, and he was a run for president, who had been so vocal in getting them back home in order to date. The men who had died. In Russia, they've been buried in our kingdom, the majority of them. The British registration being the Senate there during July and August uh, to retrieve and bring as many back as they could find. Uh, they weren't able to get them all though because many of them have still been buried near where they had fallen and now that was the territory that was held by the Bolsheviks. So they couldn't get them all. So the returning veterans of 1922, they formed a group called the Polar Bear Association, uh, open to any man, whether it was a Canadian soldier, a British soldier, a French soldier, whatever. As long as they'd been up there, uh, they, they could uh, join that group. So they had annual reunions uh, beginning in 1922, every, every even numbered year. And their primary objective in the beginning was to get the remains back from the rest of the land. So ultimately, the uh, Michigan uh, government legislature passed a, a bill to authorize money to send an expedition up there. It was done under the auspices of the UFW, and uh, some of the uh, officers uh, from the 339th also went with them. <coughs> and they were successful in bringing back 86 uh, additional sets of remains in 1929. On uh, Memorial Day, 1930, 44 of those were reburied surrounding the Porter Monument at White Chapel Cemetery, Troy, Michigan. The uh, monument 
have been uh, constructed and dedicated also that same day. And every year, beginning in 1930, the Florida Association would have a Memorial Day service uh, to remember that at the Florida Army. Uh, that tradition continued on in, up until the 80s when uh, most of the uh, veterans that either passed on or were too inflamed to make it to White Chapel. Uh, Stan Moses, the founder of our museum, um, Frankenmuth, uh, he, he had befriended many of these uh, for their uh, back in the 70s and uh, he was invited to attend their reunions. He would pick those up that couldn't drive, he would pick them up, take them to the reunions. So on. So he got to know a lot of them. They made him an honorary polar bear in 1980. So he made the promise to them that, that uh, when uh, they could no longer do it, he would make sure that the uh, Memorial Day service would continue on. And that the Polar Bear Association had donated five land back in the mid 50s for a professional trust fund to keep it going and to buy the wreaths and whatever. And the beneficiary was designated as the Salvation Army. So they helped during the first few years of the 80s after the Florida Association disbanded, but uh, they ran through the money real quick in the stand and we kept it going. Some of it was just him and his brother, uh, but eventually Stan through the museum, got to know more of the families, he was invited them to join them on Memorial Day and over the years when we came and he eventually uh, turned over the organizing of that some of the family members. And that's how I got involved. Originally, my grandfather's son, my uncle, uh, he was doing it. And then he got active with generation. He couldn't do it, so he has to file with it. So uh, I've been organizing that since the early 2000s, uh, making sure we've got uh, a military unit to uh, the rifle squad, a new work for tabs, a color guard, and some speakers. So we've gone in the last 30 some years from a handful of people. Now we do 200 people who show up. And we get great support from White Chapel. They set up chairs and uh, canvas arms so that we don't get sunburned. So we continue the tradition. Uh, this is taken a few years back, but uh, we've got some re reenactors there with us as well as the uh, local uh, Army Reserve out of Fraser. A question? Yes. Um, the ones who came back, survivors, are many of them also buried at your Yes. Um, what happened was, and I don't know all the details, but from what I can read, I'm surmising that you know, White Chapel was fairly new at the time. And it was out of the sticks. So yeah. they cut an agreement with the Polar Bear Association. We'll give you a plot of land for the monument and to bury the, the bodies that you recovered. And then also, uh, you can be our ambassador. So the Polar Bear Post. Uh, number 436 in Detroit, uh, many of their members helped sell plots in the same general vicinity. Mm -hmm. So that's how so many of them ended up there. Uh, as part of that drive to help uh, mm -hmm. sell, sell your plots so you and your family can be near with the Polar Bear Monument. Right. Mm -hmm. Was the Polar Bear Monument the first thing at Whitechapel Cemetery? Or no, it, in, in the background you can see the Temple of Memories was already built. Uh, so it, it didn't, there were other, other uh, buildings there. They had not acquired the additional land though south of the Temple of Memories. That occurred later on. So back in 1930 at the time, the White Chapel only went from Crooks Road over to where the freeway is now, and from the Temple of Memories north to Long Lake Road. They have since expanded. Uh, this was the first military uh, monument in White Chapel. This, they're, they're, they're just, they were designed as a garden, a garden of memories. It was a unique design among cemeteries. They were one, one of the first adopters of flush grave markers, you know, nothing upright. So the only thing that's a lot above ground are uh, monuments like this or statuary, things that they uh, uh, help commission. So, uh, we got, in addition to the Polar Bear Monument, they had the Four Freedoms Monument uh, for the World War II veterans, which also a Korean one. So that's how I got involved was uh, by leading this up and then I was, because we operated under the 501c3 of the museum, uh, eventually I was 
asked whether I'd like to join the board of directors. So I'm also on the board of directors of the Michigan's Military and Space Heroes Museum in Franklin. Uh, my uncles have donated my grandfather's uh, stuff to the museum back in 1984. Um, so we, we've had a, a long association. Now I'm going to switch gears. This is uh, recent photos taken within the last 10 years. Uh, I've got a, a pen pal of sorts up in Archangel. When the internet came to Archangel, I noticed the website that I had for the Polar Bear Memorial Association started getting visits from Russia, Martin Russia. So, uh, Alexei Sinovsky, uh, who lives up there, he's a Russian Civil War buff, and his hobby is. Uh, excavating the uh, <coughs> battlefields. And so he started sending me these photos. Uh, this area where most of the battles were fought, on both the riverfront and the railroad front, they're depopulated. The villages that used to be there are long gone. Uh, occurs through Stalin and the economy uh, approach. So they're undisturbed. All this stuff is right where the uh, Allies left it in the fall of 1919. There's a roll of armed wire. So I see right here, it's a dud artillery shell. And uh, I posted some of these on the website, and then I get people sending me emails. Does this guy know what he's doing? <laughs> <laughs> and I couldn't answer for sure, so I, I, I he, he doesn't write or speak English. I don't write or speak English. Have you heard from him since then? <laughs> <laughs> but, but he does German, and I do a little German, so we just before you had good translators online, so using some German, he explained that his eyesight, he sees he's wearing glasses, his eyesight was too poor to serve in the Red Army. But we still had to do some sort of compulsory service. So he was trained to decontaminate uh, aircraft crash sites, things like this. So recover remains, uh, recover ammunition, recover ordnance, and then safely dispose of it. So he did get training in in, in handling this stuff. So from that I can safely say that uh, he's been doing it for 10 years, he's still kicking it, and I think he had enough training so he can do it safely. And I'll get to meet him, I'm going up there uh, August, yeah. the rest of this year I'll get there to uh, meet him face to face in that crowd of years. Because he's always been telling me, you need to come, you need to come and see this. And, uh, I figure if I don't do it next year or, or this year now, which is the 100th anniversary, I probably never mm -hmm. will. So I've got my stuff in the travel regions booked, and I'm just waiting for my visa approval to come back. These are photos he took of uh, areas. Uh, well, I think these are all from the railway front. There's an artillery shell crater. It's tundra. There's permafrost under there, so this stuff never totally flies. And when it gets warm, it turns to a swamp and a muck. So the conditions in the terrain are really terrible. This, these are buttons for a bridge that most likely was built by the pre-tech engineers. You know, the planking's gone, but the buttons are still there. This is the, the uh, hand aids and the ammunition clips that he's found. Uh, here's one he sent back to me. I, I set up a, a journalist from Vanity Fair who was going to do an article. I, I connected him with Alexi, so the journalist went out there and uh, Alexi showed him around. And, uh, while they were at the verse 444 on the railroad front, he had his detector, a metal detector, and he honored this. So he asked uh, Scott Anderson if he was bringing it back with him. So Scott brought it back and mailed it to me. So this is. The wooden handle's broken, that's probably why it was discarded. This is a Lindemann entrenchment shovel, a uh, standard issue to all the allies, so it's hard to say whether it was actually used by an American. But uh, it's still got all the dirt on it, right from the, uh, the forest. <coughs> uh, my, my grandfather saved uh, his box that he got his ammunition in, it was dated the 1880s. Um, is that, uh, yeah, now is that, is this stuff here American or British? Um, Combination. Oh, is it? Okay. Yeah. 
they were given those on the ground rifles, which uh, so the six two cartridge, they yeah, have yeah. standard that the all the allies used. Uh, seven six two by fifty four R. Yeah, it, and it was also the same car, uh, cartridge that the Russians used. Yeah, right, and that's why they So that, that 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 actually made that actually did make sense. Uh, the Americans also, uh, you mentioned that they were issued uh, Vickers and Lewis machine guns. Actually, in one re in one sense, uh, given what the Americans had in France as far as machine guns, uh, they were lucky mm -hmm. because those machine guns were at, uh, the the Lewis and the Vickers were actually better machine guns than what the Americans had in France. They had something called the Chauchat or the Chocho. And there's a lot of uh, <laughs> accounts from American troops that had those things that were cursing them every which way in, in, uh, from Sunday. And a lot of that stuff that they, uh, the language that did survive, I don't think the ladies would like to hear or see. <laughs> <laughs> The Lewis was an air-cooled British design with a loaded drum, and the Vickers was a water-cooled drill, which obviously was not the right thing to send to North Russia. They had to experiment with mineral oils, alcohol, all kinds of other things. Basically, they had to sleep with their machine gun, and even that wasn't enough to keep the Vickers guns from freezing up in a water jacket. But going back to the 1880, maybe that was just a case or something. So, the design of the design of God, uh, I think, is uh, early 1900s. And the cartridge, I don't think, it goes back to the 1880s. I don't know. I did some research on that. This is Alexei in the trench. It was dug by the Allies. And that's not leaves, those were grass cartridge cases. It's just littered with it. Right where they fell. He just has to get the muck and leaves off of it. And Finds all this stuff still there. Yeah. Oops. This is a railroad siding, abandoned, and the trees going up the middle of it. Uh, here's some then and now shots. This was taken by the 310th engineers. This photo here. It's an unusual. Most of the block houses up there, at least all of them that were built by the 310th engineers, were made out of logs. This is unusual in that it's a concrete wall with a wooden roof. Now the roof's long gone, but the concrete walls are still there right alongside. This is protecting a bridge, railroad bridge, over a river that's in the background. Um, and what I've tried to get some understanding, no one seems to be able to answer the question why that blockhouse was built on the south side of the river. So it doesn't make sense. That because Archangel is on the other side of the river. So you'd think if this was a defensive blockhouse, it would be on the north side of the river to protect the bridge. I, I don't know. This placement is unusual. Nobody's been able to explain who built it. It definitely wasn't built by the Americans. Um, I think, though, since this picture's been taken, they built a new bridge and double tracked it, and this is gone now. I will be able to see the train station on over Chicago, which was the headquarters for uh, the medical units. And you can see the Red Cross flag here. This is a 1919 picture. It was basically a, a hospital uh, for the wounded uh, sick. And the uh, first thing changed today. They electrified the railway down to this point between here and uh, in Moscow. And, and that's the end of the electrified railway. So if you got any other uh, questions or things that uh, I can't answer today, here's some additional resources. You got a question? Yes. Um, my grandfather's commanding officer was a lieutenant cop, and um, apparently he was attacked at night and drawn and quartered and hung in a tree. They had a, a memorial service for him. And my grandfather took one of the candle holders from the church so that he'd never forget, don't ever trust a Russian. <laughs> but would they have had funeral services in that St. Michael's? or Not likely there. They would be in the, the, the chapels. Usually these small villages and towns would have a, a, a crude chapel. So they would have 
services there or graveside. The photos I've seen mostly, I think the ones with the cuff, uh, you can see in graveside that that had been after some services okay. within the church. But, uh, what do you know about that incident? Uh, I'm aware of the name. There's so many of them that all start to melt together, but I can get you more information okay. about that one. My grandfather took it very hard. I think the photo of that, there's also some descriptions in some of the books. Mm -hmm. uh, this one is a pretty good long Russian sideshow. Uh, the author uh, writes about not only the North Russia expedition, but also the Siberian expedition. So you can see what was going on in parallel, and how things turned out differently uh, in Siberia. And the general in charge there didn't, uh, he, he did not take orders from the British. Uh, a little bit better for the man. So that's a good book with a lot of detail. Uh, the book that Stan wrote, unfortunately, is out of print. There's a lot of information in there. I think there's some items from the cup and there's some photos. I'll go into that. This is a book that was written just a few years ago. It's taking the memoirs of one of the medical men and put it in the books. Gordon Olson did the editing. Uh, got a few years since uh, my marks. It's pretty good, pretty, pretty good reading. It gives you a good feel of how, how crude some of the things were you know, in terms of uh, the supplies and the food, uh, the medical treatment, and all that. Uh, there's one case that I know of where the uh, fellow named Charles Doe, he uh, was in an artillery garage. I told 1918 at Salzo, and Shrapnel nearly started his life for a lot of years like me, but he's still hanging on. And the family contacted me, they had a lot of followers on that. He passed away in 1941, but in the obituary, the death notice from 41, said that his leg had to be amputated in the field by pocket. I want to know, what could I, is there any way to verify? I was able to find another reference from another lieutenant that wrote something and said that talking about generalities, medical treatment wasn't the best for the man, and included field amputations. He might have been talking about it, but I couldn't prove that. And eventually, uh, a gentleman in the Upper Peninsula contacted me. He had his uh, father's set recording that was made telling him his stories. The set recording was made in 1982, and it was a type transcript. He wanted to know if I wanted it because he found my lips. He said, sure, I'll take it. So I, dust, I eventually dusted that off on the back of it after I read this information to the camera which I to go. Sure enough, in his description, he talks about that day. He was the one who cut the tenements off. Oh, wow. It was pretty cool. Yes? Uh, Mr. Rebel, I, uh, two questions. The first question you were talking about that there were air, well, not really hangars, but tents for aircraft. Uh, I'm not familiar with any military aircraft of that era that functioned at 20 degrees below. So were the aircraft just there for show, or did they actually use them? They, they, they managed to get off. They uh, were bombed by hand, hand bombs. Okay. Uh, the Bolsheviks had planes, that's why they had to have them. Bolsheviks would do uh, aerial observation as well. Uh, so they, they flew uh, year round. They got them off the ground somehow. Somehow. Okay. <laughs> Second. And after the Americans left, the British brought the reinforcements in. They also brought a group up there uh, for chemical warfare. So there were gas shells that dropped. It was like a tear gas. It wasn't a mustard gas. But they actually did aerial bombardment with improvised shells that were made in these hangars and they were dropped by hand. So oh, nice. there was some kind of a warfare up there. Then those planes were used for observation and for hand delivery of small bombs. And the second question had to do with the petition that was signed to bring the troops home. Uh, you had mentioned that at the time Wilson was pretty much useless at that point. His wife was running the country. Um, what was her response to the petition? I, I don't remember. So the, I think the petition was to Congress, so they, they never went to the White House. Okay. But that that, that would be why Congress was the one to go to because the White House wasn't actively involved. As far as he was concerned, 
all his remaining energies are on the League of Nations. Okay. And this would get discussed in these meetings of the League of Nations. Uh, but they could come to an agreement on what to do about all this fighting that's still going on in North Russia, Siberia, and also in Central Russia. The British were still fighting even in the 1920 in some areas against the Bolsheviks in Central Russia. There was a lot of, of loose ends that never got tied up. It was all under the pressure on Congress to got that. Because I remember that uh, his wife was active in a lot of causes back in the late um, 19 teens. And I was surprised that she would be involved in this. Yeah. I don't know enough about that. Okay. Uh, to be able to comment much more than that. Uh, one new book, this came out in August. Uh, this tells the British side of what happened. Uh, very interesting. After the war, basically our polar bears came home and they were all discharged within a few weeks and this was swept in the rugs. The British kept all the records classified. So researchers, until recently, they were, when they were declassified, researchers couldn't go over the original records on um, this uh, intervention from the British military point of view. Now that, this is the first book that we've been able to do that. We've got a lot of dense reading in it. It mentions the Americans in passing. We will talk some more about the, uh, the British strategies and Churchill's role. Uh, How long did the British and the French remain in that area? The uh, Americans left uh, beginning in uh, June and last were out by mid-July, except for the British registration. The French left at the same time as the Americans. In fact, some of them had left a little earlier to go to the Brits. There were some of them in prison. They had a real problem with the French. There's none of that one to be there either. Yeah. Uh, the British, though, eventually evacuated in mid October. The rest of them were out. Okay, so it's the same. The white Russians that they left all this equipment with, they held out until February of 1920. So from October to February, and that's when the Wall Street stand there. Uh, if I remember correctly, Archangel was also one of the ports that, uh, or Angelus, if I remember correctly, uh, was the uh, one of the main ports for the Allied convoys of, in World War II as well. Dervish. That was the name of the uh, convoys, the Dervish, Operation Dervish, yes. And that's been remembered. They just had a dedication ceremony for a monument. Uh, this, represent the 75th anniversary of that. And yeah, Alexei was involved in that too. Along with that, I think the Port of Murmansk. Yeah, and Murmansk did not exist at the start of World War I, the Great War. Murmansk was just a fishing village. But they were able to, uh, in the early years of World War I, extend a railroad line up to Murmansk and turn it into an all-weather port because it never freezes. So a lot of the war material was able to come in after 1917, uh, out of Murmansk. But Archangel was the primary port. It had uh, a lot better docking facilities and warehouses. Yes? Um, I know that most of them had to go down to Custer to be trained and sent out. But did anybody track that in a book? Like Macomb County kept track of everything that went on in World War I. And I have the entire book they wrote on it. And when each person was called up and sent, and my uncle's in that, who then became the polar bear. And is there a Wayne <coughs> County one also that kept track of everything that was going on at that time? I'm looking for some people, and I can't track them from that time. Do <coughs> you know if Oakland has one? Like, was McComb the only real anal group that? No, I know Genesee County has a. a uh, book on the Great War and stuff like that. So they, uh, the counties, it would have been left to each county. Yeah, I know I've seen one for Kalamazoo County. They yeah. have a pretty good one. But I Where think it's it just up to. A lot of them are uh, in the uh, U of M library. I would try to Bentley to see okay. if they have some of those. If not, they need to be in their archives associated with U of M. I want to point this out. Bentley Historical Library on the North Campus. They've got a pretty good collection, but it's mostly textual. And they don't have uniforms and medals, but 
They had books, diaries, maps. They got all the blue line maps from the three tenth engineers uh, were brought back. So you can see the block houses where I've taken photos of them, and uploaded them to Lexi. And he's reported that. Yeah, these machine gun replacements and block houses, you can find them, but there's twice as many of them <laughs> the British built after the Americans So there's a lot of resources there. Most of their stuff has already been digitized, and you can find it on their website. Um, but if you uh, search the U of M library system, you can find some of these other books, like the Kalamazoo County book, and so if there's others out there, you might be able to find them out. I went through all the cemeteries, the little bitty ones that I could kind of get my arms around, and searched for all World War I people. And then I searched to see who was a polar bear. And I came up with a Mr. Tarnowski that you helped me verify and send to them for them to accept. I don't know if you remember that. Yeah, yeah, yeah. <laughs> I, I just thought, wow, and there might be more, you know? So I was still trying to, to yeah. figure it out. Yeah, their roster is not 100% because they're. The Army never kept human rosters until close to World War II. So back then, uh, to find a roster, you got to compile it from a variety of sources. Some of the sergeants would keep a list of all their men and their addresses so they could contact them after you know, for the unions. Uh, a book was written about Company A, so they have a complete roster of Company A in there. Uh, but it's hit or miss. Company I wasn't very well documented. But what I just recently found on Ancestry they have the troop, uh, U.S. Army troop transport passenger list. Oh, yes, I've seen those. And I'm in the process of downloading those now and making a searchable roster. And that will be the most complete roster I think that one could find. Uh, because the one that the has been created by looking at periodicals like this, reunion booklets, things like that, mentions in other books. So it's created from secondhand sources. If you get a passenger list off of troop transport, you know, those were kept up to date in the last minute. They would strike your name out saying, no, you got sent on another ship or whatever. So uh, I got about two thirds of them downloaded and I'm taking the, because I can copy and paste the index because it's searchable. So I'm creating a spreadsheet with that. So we not only have the actual image, but we we'll also have a textual. There may be something else. Uh, every unit in the Army, and this, is, this goes back prior to the Civil War even, uh, had something that they called the morning report. It was done every day. It listed everyone in the company from soup to nuts and, and, and their status, whether they were present for duty, whether they were on leave or what have you. These were normally turned in. You may be able to find these things either in the National Archives or at the U.S. Army Center of Military History at Carlisle Barracks. Um, all, all they the, might be. You might want to try, uh, try them. All the AMRF original documents are in College Park, Narrow Two, in the College Park. I've been there and gone through the stacks. Uh, I focused on coming out because I wanted to get yeah. the after action reports. I don't recall ever seeing the morning report or anything. <coughs> the manila folders are just like they left them. Well, when they closed in 1919. I used to I, I used to be curator of division, historian of the first cavalry division, back in the mid 1970s, and we had several in, in the museum at Fort Hood. We had several more old morning reports from the Civil War. Uh, so that's why that's why I'm talking about this and, and saying what I'm saying. Uh, there's a possibility. I'm not saying it, that there is. I mean, there, they still exist, but there might be a possibility that, that you might be able to find something on that. If I can find some time somewhere. I want to go back. I yeah. spent a week there at Mira. Uh, it wasn't enough. Uh, I could spend a month there. What, what made it so, what, what, what drew my mind to this is I remember these things were all painstakingly handwritten, and the thing was like about yay long for a company. <coughs> is your uh, travel that you're going to do to go back to Archangel, is that part of a group or is that a personal private? It's a personal trip, uh, it's not part of a tour group, but if anyone is interested in going, I can help you get started and take a long uh, the original 
Alexi works with the local travel agency to offer battlefield tours. And he's done this before for others. So you work through the travel agency and you write them a check and your food, your gas, and everything, the translator is all paid for. So I'll be doing that. So if anyone wants to be there at the same time, the cost for that, I'm sure, will go down. And it's being shared across the country. So if anybody's interested in all, I mean, contact me. I give you the particulars. It's not just a simple, uh, like, you know, getting the visa is the hardest part of the whole thing. And I've been working on that for a month. And, uh, they, they want to know the questionnaire, online questionnaire that you fill out, 31 questions. They want to know everybody you've ever worked for, the name of the supervisor. They want to know if you ever fought, you know, or ever were in the military, and if you were in during fighting wars. Do you uh, own and know how to use a gun? Uh, and, uh, <coughs> How many countries you've been to, and give us the dates for the last 10 years. Uh, your wife's name and address, your father's name, your mother's name. Uh, just a whole raft of questions. I'm on the third iteration of this, working with the, uh, the, uh, the contractor that works for the Russian Council. Land of the free. Uh, so they're very meticulous. Uh, if you stay more than seven days, not only do you have to have the uh, visa, <coughs> and your thing, you have to receive a, a registration permit from the local authorities and carry that with you all times and surrender on Before I could even begin the visa process, I had to get a letter of invitation. So you've got to know somebody there or find a travel agency willing to invite you. And they give you a, a, a legal document with some numbers on it that go with this visa application. So that's a, no wonder my travel agent, she was happy in getting my uh, Hotel and flight, she says, well, we don't do these things. <laughs> so, Lexi on Facebook? Yes, oh, I should mention that we have a Facebook group, for the museum, but this is a military museum. Also, and there's a Facebook group from the Polar Bear Memorial Association. And Lexi's on there. And she's being in right now for this, and a few other British gentlemen, because now this word is spreading around. Brits are asking questions. They used to ask me, you know, what do I know about the British stuff? Because they couldn't find anything from the local archives. That was because it was still classified. Now it was declassified. Uh, they're finding more about their grandparents. Well, grandpa that grew up. Can you look at your books? Sure. <clears throat> Is there anything special going on at White Chapel this year because it's the big year? Uh, I'm trying to enlist a few, uh, one or more prominent speakers. I don't have that uh, worked out just yet, but I'm still working on it. Yes, it will be considered uh, the centennial event. It will be on the U.S. Centennial Commission's calendar of uh, official activities. So, typically we uh, do a ceremony that includes one couple of speakers. Uh, the color guard presents the colors. Um, we have uh, a record model. We're usually done in 45 minutes. She would be taken on. So try and keep it simple, straightforward. These guys want to remember. We're also looking at doing the symposium on September oh, yeah. 4th. Yeah, uh, to recognize the centennial of the arrival of the troops in our kingdom, we're going to have a, a symposium. And it may include uh, several speakers. We don't have all the details worked out on that. Tentatively, that's going to be September 4th, which is the actual date. Uh, I need to talk to you about that, though. I've got some advice from the museum CEO that's done things to try and hold it, remember the date. And if you do it Tuesday the day after Labor Day, she says you may be talking to me. Yeah. You might want to think about the weekend. Yeah. We will definitely be doing something the first week of September in inside Detroit City limits because they were Detroit's own. Right. So, I have a question. Yes. Um, I've been doing some research this past week at Dearborn Historical Museum, uh, which is where uh, the Rouge uh, began and where the Eagle Boats were. Yes. And I ran across a photograph of Eagle Boats number one and two taken at Archangel. Yep. They were in service up there. It was only for a couple of weeks. I can send you an email. I'll send you the Navy document I found confirming the dates of all U.S. Navy vehicles. We're in the waters off of Mermans and Archangel. Yeah. These needles. 
Yeah, it's great. I got a copy of the photograph when I was over there. So. Very cool. The actual dates. Yeah. The Olympia, I should have mentioned that. Uh, the Olympia was up there. They never made it into Archangel Port, but they were in Murmans. And uh, they were with the British when they arrived uh, in Murmans in early August before they went to Archangel. And the commander of the British fleet asked uh, the uh, commander of the, uh, the captain of the uh, Olympia for the Olympia's band and 50 sailors who were trained as riflemen. So they transferred them to the British ship, and so the Olympia Band and 50 U.S. sailors were there on August, on August uh, 2nd, 1918, when they sailed up to the venue. Really? I should also add that uh, that same Olympia Band played on September 4th when the three ships carrying the 339 <coughs> and the 10th were the Dark music they played for them was Hail to the Victors. Yay, <laughs> yay. <laughs> 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 I saw that in my head. So there's a lot of, lot of uh, mixing in. There's another anecdote if I got time. Uh, the three weeks that they were in uh, England getting new equipment and everything before they went to North Russia. The camp was right next to a railroad station, they were only like 20, 30 miles outside of London. So they would literally give out day passes to <coughs> men to go see London, do some sightseeing. So uh, <coughs> Lieutenant Harry Mead is walking down one of the streets in London near the war office, and he looks up and sees an old friend. The old friend sees him and, hey Harry, what you doing? Whoa, I was going to ask you the same thing. What are you doing here? Well, Harry says, I'm with the 339th, and we're supposed to go over to the Western Front. And Lowell says, well, I just came from the British War Office, and I heard you're going to North Russia. Yeah. <laughs> so that's how Lieutenant Harry Mead found out about it. It was from his old friend, Lowell Thomas. Lowell Thomas? Yeah. Who had just arrived in London from... Saudi Arabia, where he'd been hanging out with T.E. Lawrence. Lawrence of Arabia, he was giving a report back to the war office, where he picked up that too. So, all kinds of fun, yeah. strange anecdotes. There's a, 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 a private who was a Canadian citizen, but he was the dog robber for one of the uh, American officers at Camp Custer for the line. That's the guy his order. He, uh, he would take care of the officer's shoes and let him in. And one day the officer reached him out, ran him up and down for not doing the job right. So the guy turns up eight one. So they're trying to find him, they're fine, so 339, 310. Everybody moves out and they go overseas. They spot this guy walking down the street in London. Wearing a name. I forgot about this book here too. Uh, it's on sale here in Malawi. That's a photo. You know, when the men got off the steamer on Bell Isle, we saw the banner. This is looking the other direction as we're marching off the steamer. Uh, so there's some information in this book on some of the boards. Some of your um, slides from that book are the same pictures. Where did you get those slides? These photos, this photo and some of the ones that I have are from the Detroit News Archives.